Welcome to the McElhaney Report. I'm Bill McElhaney. Each show we cover a crucial issue of the day, but always from a viewpoint or perspective rarely, if ever, aired by the mass media. We hope you'll find it interesting. This is perhaps the most important interview we've ever conducted. Since 1989, we've been told constantly by the mass media and the government about the so-called death of communism and the collapse of the Soviet Union and its Eastern European satellite nations. We are told that the new Russian rulers are democratic and opening up to political and economic freedom. The Bush and Clinton administrations have proposed even greater aid from U.S. taxpayers to the rulers of what is called the new Russia and the new Eastern European states. They tell us that we must aid and be partners with these rulers and join with them in a new world order. Our guest today can refute this conventional wisdom. He is one of two outstanding experts in the free world on this subject. The other expert, Anatoly Galitsyn, the source of this information, has been living in the United States in hiding under an assumed identity since 1960 to protect himself from murder by the Soviet KGB. Our guest today is editor of the London-based periodical Soviet Analyst and editor of Galitsyn's second book just published in the spring of 1995, The Perestroika Deception. I want to welcome Christopher Story to the McElhaney Report. Delighted to be here. Very happy to have you, sir. For our listeners who are unfamiliar with this subject, we must start at the beginning. Anatoly Galitsyn, this is one of maybe one or two existing public photographs of him, probably taken 30 years ago. Who is Anatoly Galitsyn, and what did he reveal when he defected from the Soviet KGB in 1960? Galitsyn is the most important defector ever to have reached the West. He came out actually in 1961. Uh, he fled to Finland in 1961 with his family, and he revealed the existence of a long-range strategy of deception based on Leninist principles uh, and his importance is that all defectors who've come since him appear to have been engaged in an attempt to refute what he says so uh, we look to Galitsyn as the source of proper insights into what the communists are really up to and he predicted, did he not, that uh, the KGB would send false defectors deliberately to discredit him. That's correct. And this happened almost immediately afterwards, within six months. Several defectors, now, both from the KGB and from the military intelligence, in addition in to States. identifying, In addition to identifying Soviet moles in, European and Ameri in the European intelligence system, British intelligence system, French, he provided this whole new understanding of Soviet disinformation strategy. There was one man in the CIA who listened to him seriously. That was James Angleton. Tell us yeah. about Angleton. James Jesus Angleton was a very remarkable counterintelligence expert. And he debriefed Galitzin. And he became absolutely convinced that Galitzin was telling the truth. This is clear from internal evidence. but. Um, uh, Angleton uh, became aware through Galitsyn of the significance of what the Soviets were really up to. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, what Galitsyn taught and revealed was that these all co uh, Soviet governments are Leninist governments. They're driven by the deception strategy perfected by Lenin which is aimed at achieving a long-range strategy, namely control of the whole world. And part of this strategy as really put into a, a uh, codified plan by 1959 mm -hmm. dealt with creating the impression that um, liberalization or destabilization, mm -hmm. decentralization was occurring in the communist mm -hmm. states as a way of lulling the West into putting down its defenses. Yeah. Um, what happened was that, uh, according to Galitsyn, is that after the death of Stalin, the communists realized, in general, that the method of control that they'd been adopting, namely brutal repression, was an inefficient method of achieving control over populations, and that it was more uh, efficient to seek 
uh, to achieve control through infiltration and deception mm -hmm. and through the control of the minds of the target. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, the party instructed Alexander Shelepin, who was the head of the KGB in 1958, to develop a plan for the use of the total resources of the revolution. And the KGB and the GRU, military intelligence, were instructed to become the instruments of the mobilization of the resources of the revolution. So between 1959 and 1961, Shelepin um, developed, perfected, and agreed with the party the full outline of this deception plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the deception plan is uh, basically uh, a means of projecting communism into the whole of the rest of the world. And they do it through deception, and we can examine how this is done as we go on. Well, one of the features of the plan, obviously, was to give the impression that the international communist movement was breaking up, that there were splits, divisions, sure. dissent, that there, were, there was a rift between uh, Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, there was a rift between Red China and the yeah. Soviet Union. All of these things were examples mm. of this dis disinformation strategy, yeah. and one of the, the principal goals of it would be that the West would, uh, would, would, feel, would feel more secure and, le and put down mm. its guard. Yes. Lenin Lenin's methodology involves the use of the dialectic. Now, the Western mind, which is a civilized, developed mind, does not understand dialectical deception, mm -hmm. which is basically a Mongol concept. And um, the, the, China, the, the fake Russia-China split is a good example. Mm -hmm. By creating the false impression that there was a split, which incidentally they've continued ever since, because yeah. now we have communist China and uh, supposedly non-communist Russia, so mm -hmm. the illusion of the split continues. Right. The West was lulled into believing that uh, if it supported China, it mm -hmm. would be uh, taking precautionary action against Russia. Yes. In fact, what's happening and is continuing, they are both working together, yes. and their intentions ultimately are hostile. They're in th they are aggressively oriented towards the West. Yes, uh, and another, another consequence of staging deliberately staging a phony uh, encouragement of or, or setting up let's say setting up phony the KGB setting up phony dissident movements within communist countries and supposedly uh, or in a theatrical way presenting what appears to be liberalization or some lessening of tight control that also has the effect of lulling the underground, the genuine underground yeah. opposition to communism in these countries out in the open, mm. giving them the false hope that they can speak yeah. out, and then further identifying them and destroying yes. them. Well, this goes back actually to Tsarist uh, days. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Tsarist uh, secret police were adept at this. Mm -hmm. But uh, Stalin's uh, henchman, the, the founder of the Cheka, Dzerzhinsky, um, was particularly uh, skilled at using what we call false opposition. And in fact, this uh, was, was the main thrust of Lenin's strategy in the, in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. When Lenin launched into the West what is known as the Trust, um, he exported, he allowed uh, the emigration of a large number of emigres. And in their number were many controlled communist mm -hmm. members of the Cheka. And uh, he introduced this false controlled opposition to Western intelligence. And, West, and as a result, Western in, the, the perception of Western in, by Western intelligence of what was really happening mm -hmm. was distorted. Now, this principle has been applied since 1961, and it came to its fruition under Gorbachev. Gorbachev's perestroika, which means restructuring, is in fact the restructuring not of Soviet society, although that was done for, uh, there was a certain amount of reform and restructuring to give it credibility. Superficial. It, superficial. It is it, essentially the restructuring of the Western mind, mm -hmm. the control of the Western mind. That is what it means. Stalin used the word perestroika, and it meant, um, in Stalin's vocabulary, it meant the reshoeing of a horse. 
Uh, so peri the West misunderstood perestroika, the meaning of perestroika, thinking that it meant reform of the communist movement. And this is In because, fact, it's a deception. Yes, and this is because everything that we've witnessed since 1989 has been part of this grand dis disinformation strategy which Golitsyn yeah. revealed in his 1984 book, New Lies for Old, had been prepared by 1959. Yes, the long-range strategy is what it says. It, it's a long-range strategy. It took years to come to fruition. There are a number of reasons for this. They had to allow, for example, those with memories of the Stalin repressions to die off. Mm -hmm. They had to ensure that the true opposition no longer existed, and they have liquidated all true opposition in all East European countries. In all communist all countries. countries. The, which the, means, with a few exceptions. Which means, as Galitsyn has pointed out, then that we hear, well, and those deceptions are subject to question, those exceptions are subject yes, to question. Yes, even those deceptions. But when we see a supposed dissident movement mm. within a yes. communist or so-called former communist state, having access to the media, operating openly, sure. having resources, and being able to express right. itself and be heard around yeah. the world, it would immediately mm -hmm. be suspect of being a KGB front operation, at least mm -hmm. in terms of its leadership. Absolutely correct. Yes. And as a result of the ex uh, what Gorbachev, uh, Gorbachev first of all launches perestroika mm -hmm. internally, and when the softening up process has been completed, i.e. the West is attuned to the fact that there's been this apparent reform mm -hmm. and that it's all falling apart, mm -hmm. They then export perestroika to the whole world, yes. so that in fact what has happened is that you have, instead of having walk-ins, you know, uh, defectors arriving and knocking on the West door, you've got a mass walk-in, mm -hmm. uh, so that no one knows who's genuine and who isn't. Mm -hmm. To go back just a bit regarding uh, Golitsyn defecting to the American CIA in the early 1960s, he had an advocate in James Angleton. Yeah. And the influence of what Golitsyn revealed was felt through Angleton's policies. Yes. But that came to an end in 1974 when Angleton was fired by CIA Director William Colby mm -hmm. after Golitsyn had warned that there were Soviet moles, Soviet yes. agents within the CIA mm -hmm. at high levels. Um, to what extent was Golitsyn vindicated by the Aldrich Ames exposure? Totally. I mean, Gillitsyn has been telling everybody mm -hmm. since he finished the first book, New Lies for Old, which actually he finished in 1980, yes. although it was only published in 1984, that the CIA was penetrated. Mm -hmm. This was obvious from internal evidence. Now, of course, with the, the Ames case, uh, that is proved. I mean, everybody knows that there are many more moles inside more Western moles, intelligence yes. than just Ames, but uh, Ames is a, is a symptom of the penetration of the Central Intelligence Agency. In the book, as you said, written in 1980, published in 1984, Galitsyn's New Lies for Old, um, he revealed not only this massive disinformation strategy, which goes back to 1959, and, and the ramifications of it, the applications of it during the 1960s, 1970s, but he made a series, the book was published in 84, he made a series of incredible predictions regarding what was mm -hmm. going to come as a result of this strategy yeah. and the predictions are just amazing yeah. to read. Can we go, would you go over some of them? Well, I mean, uh, he had, there are three or four pages which are just chock-a-block full of predictions. Uh, he, he talks about the removal of the Berlin Wall, liberalization starting in East Germany and spreading to the rest of uh, Eastern Europe. Um, he, he says, for example, that Dubček will be restored in Czechoslovakia, which duly happened for a brief period. Mm -hmm. um, and, gener and he talks about a reconciliation with the West and the reunification of Germany and so on and so forth. And in a recent book published by Mark, uh, written by Mark Riebling uh, called Wedge, The Secret War Between uh, the FBI and CIA, published in 1994, uh, Riebling uh, carries out a, a, method, uh, a careful analysis of um, Galitzin's uh, predictions in New Lies for Old, and he established that out of 148 falsifiable predictions, 139 had been verified by 1993. Now that, uh, and he gave him a, uh, an accuracy rating of uh, over 94 mm percent. -hmm. That is without parallel in the West. Mm -hmm. I mean, this puts Galitzin 
in a, in a separate category from everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, I think. In other I, words, if Galitzin is not telling, if is oh. not telling the truth about having everybody this, has to explain why these well, predictions were correct. If he's not telling the truth about the fact that all that we have witnessed since 1989 was planned mm -hmm. as Soviet disinformation strategy, mm -hmm. going back this far, then he has to be a prophet. He just has to. He has to be a clairvoyant. Either he has to be. He has to have supernatural powers. He has to have supernatural powers. Or yes. he has to understand Soviet strategy. That's right. And of course the answer is the latter. Yes. He understands Soviet strategy because he knows that it's based on the thinking of Lenin. He studied Lenin. Now one of the things that I've done in the last few years is go back to Lenin and try to read and understand this, what this evil man is saying. Mm -hmm. He's actually preaching hatred. He's preaching uh, how to deceive. And he's teaching us how to deceive. And Lenin's disciples remain in control of the world communist movement. Mm -hmm. All they've done is relabeled themselves mm -hmm. in order to appear uh, acceptable to the West. There's a passage in Lenin where he says that, there's a, that there may come a time in the revolution when uh, true revolutionaries must put on the appearance and the clothing and the manner and the language of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And this is what they've done. So that. Um, and, and it's very easy to see that this is the case once one understands that this is what's going on. If you take someone like Andrei Kozirev, the Russian foreign minister, you can see mm -hmm. that everything he says is a deception. Mm -hmm. he, he, he is an absolute, he's the most brilliant mm -hmm. representative of the Leninist case mm -hmm. uh, currently operating. He's the son, incidentally, of one of the um, Soviet uh, diplomats who were uh, kicked out of London by, uh, by the Douglas Hume government in 1972. There is a description in New Lies for Old of a new liberal or more democratic figure who would emerge as the leader of the Soviet Union sure. that is a mirror image of Mikhail Gorbachev. Yes. Now tell us about Mikhail Gorbachev and perhaps uh, his apparently more credible, at least in the eyes of the world and the media, successor Boris Yeltsin. Did they ever show any trace of interest in democratic reform? Well, what they did show an interest in was uh, in the continuation of their Leninist strategy. Yes, I mean, exactly. the, the important point about Gorbachev is that, as it, in the case of Hitler and Mein Kampf, he clearly and repeatedly laid down in black and white, in speeches and in his book Perestroika, what he was doing. He made it quite clear what he was doing. In Perestroika, he said, we went back to Lenin, we reviewed Lenin, we took inspiration from Lenin, and we based our strategy on Lenin. So when I was uh, asked by Mrs. Thatcher, as she then was, to see her in the House of Commons in July 1991 to explain these matters to her, I was completely flabbergasted when she said to me, I don't think Gorbachev is a Leninist anymore. And then she also said, um, I don't think we've been deceived. At least I hope we haven't. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I was, in fact, that was the real turning point in my, the later part of my life. That was when I realized I should spend basically most of my time mm -hmm. trying to explain how, how she was conned. Mm -hmm and how wrong she was. Of course, it's very simple to do. You can show from Gorbachev's speeches, from his writings, that in fact he was constantly quoting Lenin. He, he is and was a key advocate of the Leninist world revolution. And of course, he remains so to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, Gorbachev, as you probably know, is in charge of the so-called Gorbachev Foundation, which uh, various experts led by Hans Graf Huhn, uh, a well-known German expert, has, has, have identified as, in fact, the International Department of the CPSU. And it's based here in San Francisco. Communist Party, Soviet Union. Yes. yes. The International Department of the CPSU was, in fact, the Comintern. Mm -hmm. So the Gorbachev Foundation, based in the Presidio in San Francisco, is, in fact, the Comintern. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, what Gorbachev is in charge of is influencing the Western elite. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the, the key elite, of course, is based here. This is the elite that he has to influence, mm -hmm. which is what he's been doing ever since he arrived with a large delegation in Washington in 1987. That's right. And his opponent, or his political rival, or his, um, mm -hmm. uh, the opposition, the quote-unquote mm -hmm. opposition he faced, 
Boris Yeltsin mm. comes from the same Leninist background. Oh, no question. I mean, uh, Boris Yeltsin is the, was awarded the, the Order of Lenin. He was a Communist Party chief. Uh, he's, he could not possibly have risen mm -hmm. to the level he did in, in the structures without being uh, approved at the highest level. I mean, no one can, can move without approval. Well, now, looking at the reality of what exists today in light of the predictions Gleitson made in New Lies mm. for Old, we see that as he predicted, the Soviet Union and its power and control over its uh, republics, uh, separate republics and uh, satellite mm. nations still continues through the same mm. KGB and leaden bureaucracies that have simply mm. been given new names, well, the, but that are still yeah. in place, yes. fully in place. The so-called independence of the Soviet republics is false and provisional. Uh, it's based on Lenin's fake Far Eastern Republic, which he set up in the late 1920s. Uh, and their purpose, the existence of these republics has been brought about for a number of strategic reasons. I mean, at a fairly low level, one of the most important reasons is that uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and all the international institutions have been penetrated by all these countries. So instead of just having the USSR and Ukraine and Belarus, uh, as it uh, up to 19, 1990, we now have you know 16 of these republics. Mm -hmm. So that this uh, there suddenly we've got 16 KGBs mm -hmm. and we've got 16 delegations in the World Bank and the IMF. Mm -hmm. So that these institutions have now become have metamorphosed into instruments of the revolution mm -hmm. more clearly than was the case before. That is one reason why um, they are provisionally in, in, you know, they, they were given this curious independence. But another very important reason is that with the apparent independence of these countries um, uh, they opened up scope for independent military action so that the repression which sudden, subsequently took place in Georgia, mm -hmm. Tajikistan, uh, Moldova, and in Abkhazia could take place, the minorities could be suppressed, and uh, Russia could be whiter than white. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yes. In other words, the communist, the, the, the repression was carried out by apparent non-communists. Was delegated to... Was delegated. Uh, yes, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually in the case of Georgia, where the most severe repression has been taking place, supervised by Shevardnadze, mm -hmm. who the West thought was the was a Christian you know, w was not only a Christian, but a, um, you know baptized a Christian, but the 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 architect of the end of the Cold War. Yes. He's known as Stalin II in Georgia. Yes. All right. In the early 1980s, Abraham Shifrin of Israel, an expert on Soviet concentration camps published a guidebook to these camps listing over 1,700 concentration yeah. camp sites in the Soviet Union with uh, millions of prisoners. Uh, are we to believe that all of these suddenly vanished uh, in about 1989? Are we to believe that these people suddenly, all of a sudden, set aside their ideology and suddenly started talking normally? Or the some 60 million members of the Communist yeah. Party of the Soviet Union, did they all stop being right. members of it instantly at no. the same time? Galitsyn makes it quite clear in his new book, um, the perestroika deception, that uh, the the power structures depend on the continued uh, adherence to revolutionary objectives mm -hmm. of the Komsomol. Mm -hmm. There are 50, over 50 million members of Komsomol. They work closely with the structures. And uh, so he says somewhere in the book, he says, scratch any of these so-called sudden instant Democrats, mm -hmm. and you will find underneath them a Komsomol or a secret party member. We're so going all these people you see on the uh, television screen in Moscow, they are all, without exception, secret party or Komsomol members. We're going to have to do a second show on the content of Perestroika Deception because it covers the period of 1989 through 1993 mm -hmm. and written by Galitsyn and actually derived from memorandum he, memoranda he prepared for the CIA, which they of course ignored. But we hear about um, free enterprise, uh, a burgeoning of free enterprise in, in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern European countries. Um, what is the reality of this? I mean, isn't it, isn't it overwhelmingly controlled and limited uh, in, in a way that, that makes a mockery of the term free enterprise? They themselves call it state-controlled capitalism, which is, of course, a contradiction in right. terms. What has ha happened is that Lenin's original state was a criminal state. The Chekhar, the 
Soviet intelligence controlled the mafia, invented the mafia, became the mafia. Mm -hmm. So that what th this apparent outbreak of free enterprise we see mm -hmm. is in fact controlled by the KGB. Mm -hmm. And this outbreak of uh, cr Soviet criminality and is controlled yes. Yes. and it's being exported on a global scale. Right. Why is it being exported? In order to, uh, it's one of the themes that they are developing to create problems which need global solutions yes. so that there's a world criminal crime epidemic mm -hmm. terrorist epidemic we've got to have global structures in order to contain this epidemic which they themselves have created also the uh, KGB generated criminal activity provides an excuse for ever tighter control over whatever uh, window dressing business sure. uh, or free enterprise or business yes. or entrepreneurial activity may exist over there sure and not only that but of course uh, you've got the drug element as well mm -hmm. Um, it, since the 1950s, Soviet military intelligence, GRU, has been in control of drug networks all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the, re the reason the GRU controls, uh, is involved in this is because it's sabotage. You know, the, 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 the narcotics mm -hmm. operation is sabotage. Other elements are controlled by the KGB. First of all, we're going uh, to continue in our second part of this sure. interview. I want to thank you for being with us today. If you found any of this information, as you should, interesting and disturbing, please contact us at the address or phone number given at the end of the program. We'll be happy to send you full documentation on any subject that we've discussed that may interest you. This is Bill McElhaney for the McElhaney Report, thanking you so much for joining us.